Step number one. What's step number one? Read the passage like a pro. Step number two. Realize your subjectivity. Step number three. Retrace the historical background. Step number four. Relate the passage contextually. And then step number five. Recognize the literary genre and figures of speech. Recognize the literary genre and figures of speech. Again, friends, we're showing you here seven steps, but you don't need all seven when you're studying your passage. Some passages will require only three steps. Other passages will require five, depending on your passage. But we're just showing you all seven if you need all seven. So recognize the literary genre and figures of speech. As we already identified yesterday, we have 66 books in all of the Bible. And depending on the type of genre, it will require a different hermeneutical approach. So you have their apocalyptic material, you have biography, encomium, you have their tragedy, wisdom, literature. And uh, again, what we determined is that each literary genre will require a different hermeneutical strategy. So again, looking back to Romans 13, if we're just using that as our example, uh, this, is, this passage is an epistolary material, an exposition, a carefully reasoned argument. When it says, wake up from your slumber, that is not literal, they're not actually sleeping, but that's idiomatic, metaphoric. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here. That, again, that's more idiomatic that the night of sin is almost done and then the coming of Christ is almost here. So again, you try to recognize what genre are you preaching from. Okay, and then, of course, the other genres there, one is parable. And this is where I'd like to spend just a few minutes here. As I've said yesterday, one of the most abused and misused by pastors is the parable of the is the genre of a parable. And so here are at least the three steps. What page are we in now? Three steps in studying a parable. Page 23, is that right? Okay. Three steps in studying a parable, all letter S. Study the setting, study the story, and then study the spiritual message or messages. Is that blank or no blanks? No blanks. Okay. Yeah. So let's uh, define each of these. First of all, study the setting. Now, the setting of the parable is not the place. Usually when we think of setting, it's the place. But the setting is why the parable was given in the first place. That's the setting. So the first thing you need to determine when you study a parable, ang tanong natin dito is ganito, ano ang nag kay Jesus na magbigay ng parable? What prompted the Lord Jesus Christ to give a parable? That's the setting. If you can determine the setting, you're you know, 50% done in terms of studying the parable. So that means that's the most important thing, the setting of the parable. And then after you determine the setting, what prompted him, ano yung nag sa kanya, then you need to look into the story of the parable. And this would be a, a, a human story. This would be something that is normal. It happens normally. But within the parable, something abnormal, something that is not normal, you know? Something weird happened within the parable. That's the key. That thing there that you begin to uh, notice in that parable. And then you can derive spiritual message or messages. What lessons, spiritual lessons, you can derive from this parable. Now, please remember that the spiritual message should not be far from the setting. Because the spiritual message is actually part of the setting. Jesus Christ was trying to accomplish something, tell them something through this parable. Therefore, the spiritual message should not be far out, you know, from the setting. Let's have an example. It's better to study this uh, with an example than just talk about the principles. A very familiar parable, Luke chapter 10, 30 to 37. Come on, open your Bibles, please. Luke chapter 10, 30 to 37, parable of the Good Samaritan. Open your Bibles, Luke chapter 10, 30 to 37. I'm going to ask you now, What's the first letter S? Setting. Now tell me, the parable of the Good Samaritan, what's the setting? What prompted the Lord Jesus Christ to give this parable? So if you have Luke chapter 10, verse 30, verse 30 is the parable already, isn't it? Is that right? 10.30 is already the parable, isn't it? 
to determine the setting, where should you start? Where should you be start? Uh, where should you start reading? That's right. You go before the parable, because we're trying to study the setting, find out what prompted the Lord Jesus Christ. Sige, try to uh, look into this. Verse twenty-five. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Again, you can clearly see there the uh, motive is already exposed. The lawyer was just there to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know, that's a great question. Everyone should be asking that question. Everybody with a, with a functioning brain should be asking about eternal destiny. What is, the, what is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? Verse 27, the lawyer said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So here, the, the, the lawyer was able to summarize the Ten Commandments into two parts. Alright? So, the first four commands, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And then the last six commands, love your neighbor as yourself. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, you have answered correctly. Jesus replied, do this, and you will live. But, the lawyer said, he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? After verse 29, you have now the parable. So that means, to answer the question of this lawyer, he gave them the parable. So what's the setting for the parable? What's the setting? This question, who is my neighbor? Now tell me, why would the lawyer ask him that question? Who is my neighbor? What would be the cultural background? What would be the mindset of the Jews here? Huh? Same? Ah, okay. So, neighbor would be the same... Race, all right. Okay, that's the uh, uh, the conventional way of looking at things. Love your neighbor, hate your enemies. But in this particular parable, in light of the Ten Commandments, the Jews, obviously, they were trained, they grew up thinking that the Gentiles were created as fuel for hell. Okay, that's their, that's their mindset. So, panggatong lang ang mga Gentiles sa hell. And that's why the Jews, they're very strict. They don't allow the Gentiles, obviously, to enter the, uh, the uh, temple area. There's a barrier there. The, the marker there says, if you cross this line, your ensuing death will be your own responsibility. So, they'll really die there. But then for the Jews, for example, if they allow a Gentile to enter their home, their home is desecrated, they have to burn down their home. You know that kind of separation, that kind of animosity and not only the gentiles but particularly the samaritans because the samaritans they're half-blooded jews they hated the samaritans because they tried to create their own religious worship in samaria instead of jerusalem and so they hated the samaritans all the more and so who is my neighbor the the lawyer was asking it cannot be anybody so he was trying to determine, it should be the same race, as you mentioned, the Jews. So who is my neighbor? And now let's look at the parable. To answer that question, the parable Jesus Christ gave, in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Ano ibig sabihin ng half dead? They left him unconscious. Alright? Unconscious. A priest happened to be going the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So what was the priest doing? He would pass by the other side. He tried to avoid it. He tried to avoid this uh, person who was lying there unconscious. But you know what? I found out this pass by the other side. This, uh, this is actually part of their mindset whenever they go through uh, Samaria, in particular, just to avoid the Samaritans, they would pass by the other side. So, in their geography, you have here the Sea of Galilee, you have here the Dead Sea, and of course, what separates the land is the River of Jordan. Jordan River is right there. You have three provinces here. You have the province of Galilee right here, 
And then you have Jerusalem, the province of Judea right here. And in between Galilee and Jerusalem is Samaria. And so the Jews would pass by the other side just to avoid the Samaritans. They don't want any interaction with the Samaritans. And so what the Jew would, the, the quickest way, of course, is that way. That's the quickest way. If you're in a hurry, do, you can do that, but you, know, you don't uh, interact with the Samaritans. But for normal travel, you plan it out because you go to the other side of the Jordan, you pass by it, and then you cross again, and then you go to Jerusalem. That's the passing the other side. All right? So that's their normal uh, road when they go to Jerusalem. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and so now, the same thing with the Levite. When he came to the place, saw him, pass by on the other side. And then, here comes the hero of the story. A Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. So he went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil, wine. He put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. And then, the last verse, verse 36, it says there, Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? What was the question of the lawyer? Who is my neighbor? And then here's the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you'll notice this. When somebody asked the Lord Jesus Christ, he would counter it with another question. You know, just to clarify what he really meant, to bring out the motive, why he's asking the question. So here he asked him the question, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus Christ asked him, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Now here's the question. The question of the lawyer, comparing it with the question of the Lord Jesus Christ, are they the same or are they different? The same or different? Look at it. Look at the two questions there. The same or different? Okay? So okay, let's do it this way. Those who say the same, you just do like that. All right? Those who say not the same, you go like that. Those who are not sure, you go this way. All right? <laughs> are you ready? <laughs> the same or not the same? The same. The same. All right. Again, this is the power of observation. Remember, he said there, who is my neighbor? And then here, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? So the, what is common here is the word neighbor. The, but then we need to analyze. In the mindset of the lawyer, the neighbor in his question, is this the person who needs help or the person who extends help? Who needs help? Yung sa mindset ng lawyer, who is my neighbor, the neighbor that he had there in mind is the person who needs help. Yung tutulungan ko, yung mamahalin ko. Alright? It's the person who needs help. Alright? We determine that. And so this person is the one who needs help. In the question of the Lord Jesus Christ, which of these three? Who's the three? Priest, Levite, Samaritan. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor? So yung neighbor sa context ni Christ, is this the person who needs help or the person who extends help? Aha! So there's a difference here. They're not the same context. They're two different questions. The lawyer was asking, who is my neighbor? Who should I love? Who should I extend help? But Christ said, which of these three do you think was a neighbor? The one who extends help. So how did the Lord Jesus Christ answer his question? When the lawyer asked, who is my neighbor? Through the parable, Jesus Christ answered it this way. He said, do not ask who is your neighbor. The right question is, are you a neighbor? Kapag ikaw ang naghanap ng neighbor, ikaw mamimili. Friends, we always choose you know, the people that we want to help. That's the problem. That's the human nature. We actually want to help people who can help us later on in return. Did you notice that? Gusto mong tulungan yung mga later on, makakatulong din sa'yo para siyempre naman. Tutulong ka sa sobrang hirap, mas mahirap pa sa'yo, eh wala na. Nagtapon ka lang ng pera. You know that, that kind of mindset sometimes? But uh, here, eh, there are two different neighbors here. So the Lord Jesus Christ through this parable, he tried to correct the question, do not ask who is your neighbor. The right question is, are you a neighbor? 
All right? So we have the setting. We understood the story. Something uh, different about the story, of course, the Samaritan becomes the hero, where in fact, in the minds of the Jews, they are the antagonists, they are the uh, contrabida. So that's the, that's in the parable, there will be something unusual in that parable. And then, of course, how he answered the question through this parable. Now, as I've said, the parable is the most abused and misused by pastors. Here is one pastor, how he preached from the parable of the Good Samaritan. Ito ang ginawa ng pastor. Sabi niya ganito. In reply, a man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, went away, and went away, leaving him half dead. Brothers and sisters, those people outside this church, they are half dead. They are physically alive, but they're spiritually dead. They're half dead. Those people, they need our help. Aha, very good. A priest so happened to be going down the same road. When he saw the man, he passed by the other side. You know, people, even though they're religious, but you don't see the religiousity in the way they relate to people. They just allow these people to die. The same thing with the Levite. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. When he saw him, he took pity on him. And friends, that's what these people need. They need our pity. They need our help. We need to go out to them so that we can save them, revive them from being half dead. And then he continued by saying, he went on, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey. Can you imagine that? That's the kind of help they need. You use your own vehicle to fetch these people and bring them to where? Bring them to the inn. Where's the inn? The church. Bring them here. This is where we will revive them. Because they're half dead. Use your own vehicle and fetch them and come here to the inn, to the church. That's what they need. But then, the next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Who is the innkeeper of the church? The pastor. Ibigay nyo yung pera dito sa akin. Give your money to me. I'll take care of that money and we will make sure that we will take care of these people outside. And you know what God will do? Sabi doon, when I return, I will reimburse you. You see, friends, what is so embarrassing, if Jesus Christ comes today, some of you here, in fact, many of you, will not receive a single cent of reimbursement. <laughs> Hindi kayo nagbibigay sa offering. Simba lang kayo ng simba, wala kayong binibigay na tulong sa simba. Mga tao na mamatay doon, wala kayong ginagawa. Ipakita nyo ang pagmamahal nyo sa Panginoon. Tingnan natin how much reimbursement you will get. Let's have a special offering today. Alright. <laughs> Galing. Talaga naman. <laughs> talaga naman. Makukonsensya ka talaga niyan eh. Wow. Well, there might be a, a big offering that day, but you know what the pastor did? He just uh, violated how this parable is to be interpreted. It's not about how much money we can, you know, we can have. It's the kind of heart that we have for people. Are you unable? All right? Let's have, a, uh, let's have an exercise. Rest. Let's have a... Uh, Group of five. Come on, just group yourselves into five. Let's look into Matthew 21 to 16, the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. Discuss within your group what is the setting, look at the story, and then what are the spiritual messages. Come on, in groups of five, para makadiscuss lahat. Because if you're too big, the others won't be able to really share. So just find a group of five, five or six, okay lang yan. Just turn your seats around so you can just discuss All right? And then you can appoint somebody who can report for your group. Say, findings ninyo. I think you already have some uh, discussion within your group. We're trying to answer the questions. Uh, una, what is the setting? Next, you know, the story of the parable. And then, what are the spiritual lessons? Just to uh, save time, we'll just answer one question. Tell us from your group, your discussion, your discovery, 
What do you think is the setting of the parable? Why do you think, what prompted the Lord Jesus Christ to give this parable? Ano yung nag-udyo kay Jesus na magbigay ng parable na to? Okay? So let's try to uh, put all these ideas together. Again, you, you uh, obviously um, are learning fast, especially with regards to determining the, uh, the, uh, the first letter S, the setting. Okay? So, in the setting, of course, the parable itself will not give you the setting. You need to go beyond or before the parable to determine the setting. And this is where you can determine whether you will stick with Peter or the young man, you know, before Peter came in. So, if you'll go up to verse 16, the young man came to the Lord Jesus Christ with his question, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Again, a very good question. And uh, why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is, again, the way the Lord Jesus Christ would respond to questions, he would ask them with another question. Again, this is uh, helping them, uh, helping him to determine really what's the intention, why you're asking this, clarify what, he is, what he's really asking. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. And then the young man asked, which ones? Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery. Remember, imagine here, he started with commandment number six. Commit adultery, commandment number seven. Do not steal, do not give false testimony. That's commandment number nine. And then he went back to commandment number five. Honor your father and mother. Love your neighbor as yourself as a summary of uh, commandments four to, uh, four to ten, or no, five to ten. But very interesting, he did not mention about commandments one to four, which is all about obeying God, you know. And all this I have kept, and this is very accurate here, all this I have kept, the young man said, what do I still lack? And so here, the Lord Jesus Christ is about to reveal what is really in his heart with regards to commandment number one. If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, then you will have treasure in heaven. And then he said, then come, follow me. When it comes to eternal life, when it comes to salvation, the key here really is just following the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? But there are hindrances to following him. In the case of this young man, the hindrance is his possessions. All right? So verse 22 reveals what is really in his heart. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great possessions. That means he has violated what command? Commandment number one. Thou shalt have no other gods uh, beside me. So commandment number one palang bagsak na. Yes, you have not murdered anybody. Commandment number six going down to commandment number ten. But dito palang having God enthroned in his heart, it's the possessions that has possessed him. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he gave verse 24, and this is an issue here, 24. What he meant by this is this just a figurative lang uh, language that he used here? It is easier for, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven? You know, is this just a hyperbole? You know, just an ex exaggeration that it will be very hard for rich people because they cling to their riches so much that it actually disqualifies them from entering heaven? Or is there actually an eye of the needle? You know, some researchers would say that there's actually a, a door in the world city of Jerusalem. By 6 o'clock, all the gates will be closed. If you come in after 6, they don't allow to open the big gates, but there are small openings wherein the, they say the camel has to remove all the, uh, you know, the load, and then the camel has to go through this eye of the needle. I do not know if this is really... Uh, accurate geographically and uh, you know if that's really present there in Israel but definitely the main point here is that riches can be a hindrance in going to heaven all right and that's why verse 25 then the disciples heard this they were greatly astonished and then they asked who then can be saved now that question what prompted the disciples to ask that question who then can be saved what was the mindset of the disciples the rich people, are they saved or not? In the mindset of the Jews, the, the rich people are saved. The reason they are rich is because God favors them. God is blessing them. God is happy with them. Kaya ka mahirap kapatid, you have sinned in your life. Kaya ka may sakit, the reason why you're sick is because you have sinned. That's the mindset of the Jews. That's how they think. Remember Job, when he had a problem, his three friends would say, Aminin mo na, nagkasala ka, kaya ka nagkakaganito. They always relate 
sin sa sickness or sa richness or poorness that you, you are in. And so the disciples would ask, whose sin was it that this man was born blind? Is it his sin or his parents' sin? They always related that way. And so when they asked, who then can be saved? And Jesus Christ said, with man this is impossible, with God all things are possible. You know, it's not because you're poor or rich that determines whether you're saved or not. Peter answered him, we have left everything to follow you. Remember, he told the, young, young, uh, the rich young man, it's just following Christ that determines whether we'll go to heaven or not. What then will there be for us? So friends, you notice here in verse 27, there is now a shift in terms of theme. The theme up to verse 26 is salvation. Who then can be saved? We're talking about salvation. The first question, verse 16, what should I do to get eternal life? Salvation is the theme up to verse 26. But after 26, verse 27, there's a shift in the theme. What is now the theme here? What then will there be for us? It's now about service. Salvation and now service. So the context after verse 27 is now about service. Now that we are following you, now that we're serving you, what can we get in return? All right? So there's a change of, uh, uh, of a theme here or context. So that means the parable is not about salvation. Do not connect the parable to the salvation in verse 16 because you already, there's already a shift in the context. We're now about talking about service and, the, and uh, Peter, what then will be there before us? Jesus Christ said, I tell you the truth at the renewal of all things. When the Son of Man sits on His glorious throne, you who have followed me, because that's the key, will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel and everyone who has left houses, brothers, sisters, you know, in the way you serve the Lord, children, father, mother, children, or fields for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. And that's what we all will get, inherit eternal life. But then the rewards will all be different. But then look at this. The statement in verse 30 is what bothered the disciples. Jesus Christ said, but many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. Now try to imagine this. If you're talking about service, and you're talking about rewarding service, and then Jesus Christ says, many who are first will be last, and the last will be first, what would you feel? How would you feel? Unfair. That sounds unfair. The first will be last, and the last will be first. That sounds unfair. And so the parable is to answer this verse 30, to explain verse 30, why once you are in the kingdom of heaven, we are no longer talking about justice. You see, when you say unfair, you're talking about justice. Once you are in the kingdom of heaven, we are now talking about mercy. And friends, by mercy, in God's mercy, He will give rewards and you, cannot, you don't have any right to complain. You know? So salvation is by grace through faith alone. We all receive eternal life. But once we enter the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 21, what does it say in verse 1? The kingdom of heaven is like... A landowner. So who is the landowner? Again, that's jumping quickly to conclusion because it says there, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who hires laborers. That means the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner in operation, hiring workers. That means these are all in the kingdom already. Different workers, we have different responsibilities once we are in the kingdom. It's all up to God. What responsibilities He will give us. You know, the kingdom of heaven, obviously, that we're talking about here is the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we enter the millennial reign of Christ, we will have different responsibilities. In one parable, He said, you will receive five cities. You, you will have ten cities to look over. You have, you know, one whole country. You will be the Lord of that country. You will be the king in this one territory. But the Lord of lords and the King of kings is all seated in Jerusalem. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. But friends, here's the main difference. Verse 30, and then the last, the closing of the parable, so the last will be first and the first will be last. So what you have here, the parable within, is to explain those two, two statements. So the inclusio, what is inside these two statements, is an explanation why the first will be last and the, and the last will be first. It's not unfair. Friends, how do we uh, describe this? It's like this. Justice and mercy, they travel the same road, but where justice ends, 
mercy begins. Did you get that? Justice and mercy, they travel the same road. Where justice ends, mercy begins. Now tell me, in God's redemptive plan, where does God's justice end? Where was God's justice poured? At the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. So all of us who are traveling, walking here, before the cross, if you haven't reached that cross, you're still under justice. You get what you deserve. But once you reach the cross and recognize Christ as your only Lord and Savior, you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, you now begin to follow Him, you are now under mercy. That's justice road. This is now mercy road. Friends, we are now on the mercy road. You don't talk about justice. You don't talk about being unfair. Yung pastor na yan, no? bago-bagong pastor, may kotse na. Ako, 20 years na pastor, motorbike pa rin. Lord, unfair naman to Panginoon. You know, sometimes we compare that way, isn't it? Yung isang pastor, nag pre siya. He was there in heaven. He was all lined up. And Peter was appointing them their accommodation. In front of him was a taxi driver. And the taxi driver, the Apostle Peter said, You see that mountain over, uh, you see that mansion over the hilltop? That's your accommodation. The pastor was said, Wow, taxi driver lang, mansion over the hilltop? Eh, ako preacher ako. I, I ought to get a bigger mansion over the hilltop. Pagdating ng pastor, sabi ni Faith here, You see that nipa hat down the, down the valley? That's where you go. And the pastor, That's unfair. Why should I go to a nipa hat down the valley when the taxi driver goes to a mansion over the hilltop? And Peter said, you know what? This taxi driver, he drives so crazy. All the passengers are so afraid. They prayed and received the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Many got converted because of this taxi driver. But you, when you preach, people are sleeping. You go down there. <laughs> and so friends, again, we are now in the kingdom of heaven. It's like a landowner hiring different uh, workers, but the gift, the rewards, it's all up to him. We don't complain. Whatever we get, it's by the grace and the mercy of God. And so when we say it's unfair, then you're asking for justice. In fact, there are some husbands, they would say, Lord, I deserve a better wife. Wow, can you imagine that? They would say they deserve a better wife. Friends, if you're asking for justice, you don't deserve a wife at all. <laughs> That's the truth of the matter. Nobody, no, there's no one husband here who actually deserves his wife. It's all by the grace of God. Amen. It's all by the grace of God. Kaya, yeah. Kaya yung mga single guys, mga single guys, maghanap na kayo ng babae pangalang Grace. All right. <laughs> but let me just close this portion. Somebody said, grace, I know, justice and mercy. There was this guy who brought his picture to a portrait, a portrait artist and then showed him his picture para magpagawa ng portrait niya. And then he said to the artist, Sir, you look at my picture and I hope you'll do justice to my face. What does that mean? I hope you'll do justice to my face. Kung anong nakita niyo sa picture, that's what I want to see in the portrait, ha? Huh? And then the artist took the picture and said, Sir, you don't need justice, you need mercy. <laughs> so that's the difference between justice and mercy.